that, really looking forward to our study tonight as we make our way through the Old Testament, book by book and chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Tonight, just one chapter, 2 Chronicles chapter 34. We're actually almost done with uh, 2 Chronicles, and the next book will be Ezra, a relatively shorter book, and then after that is Nehemiah. So uh, really looking forward to that if the rapture hasn't happened first. <laughs> so uh, why don't you turn there at this time, and before we jump in, we'll pray and ask God's blessing on our time together in His Word, if you would join with me. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this time that we have together on Thursday nights. It's really, for many of us, the highlight of our week because we can just come here and fellowship and study your word and worship and put aside all the busyness, all the cares and the affairs of our very busy lives, all the issues that we deal with on a daily basis, and we can just give you our attention and open up our hearts to you so that you can minister to us and speak into our lives. And that's why we're here tonight, Lord. We're looking forward to you doing just that. So, Lord, will you minister to us? Will you speak in and through this chapter that we have before us tonight? We're asking you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's jump in. Verse 1, Josiah was eight years old. Remember him? When he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Again, uh, Josiah, one of only nine good kings in the history of Israel and particularly Judah, who did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. All of the other kings, predominantly in Israel uh, and then as well in Judah, did evil in the sight of the Lord. So here we have a good king. And we're told he walked in the ways of his father David, and he did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. So chapter begins by reintroducing us to this Josiah. Uh, interesting, he was the son of the very evil king Ammon, who we uh, learned about and talked about last week. And Josiah became king at the ripe old age of only eight years old, <laughs> two years younger than my 10-year-old daughter, if you can imagine, just to put it into perspective. And uh, to his credit, he wanted nothing to do with the evil ways of his father before him, and it's evidenced by the decisions that he makes, very godly, very righteous decisions that he makes, and that at a very young age. Uh, interesting uh, to note that what Josiah did, uh, that which was right in the sight of the Lord, was actually a fulfillment of a very specific prophecy that was spoken concerning him some 300 years prior where he's mentioned by name. And we saw this in our study through 1 Kings. It's in chapter 13. I'll read verses 1 through 2. And behold... A man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Then he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, and here's the prophecy, Behold, a child, <laughs> an eight-year-old child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. Uh, I guess you could say he's going to, according to the prophecy, uh, clean house, and that's sort of an understatement. And that's exactly what he does. And as we're about to see, not only does... Josiah at eight, year, eight years old, when he becomes king, does he begin to seek the Lord? He also, at the age of 16, uh, seeks the Lord. And then four years later, at the age of 20, 20 years old, 
He be, I don't even remember when I was 20. That was way long ago. But at 20 years of age, he begins cleansing the temple. Then six years later, at the age of 26, he begins the project of repairing and restoring the temple. Now, I point this out for this reason. Actually, it's a great source of encouragement for those who are young. Uh, God uses young people. God can use teenagers. Teenagers can still be committed to the Lord. God uses old people, too, but <laughs> God uses young people. And even in our day, as evil as it is in the last days, it's still possible for young people to be really committed to the Lord. I think of Mary, and I don't know if you think of it this way very often, but you know when the angel appeared to her to tell her that she was with child, that she would give birth in the virgin birth to the Savior of the world. She was a teenager. I think of David, King David, when he was anointed to be the king of Israel to succeed Saul from whom the kingdom had been torn, he was a teenager, probably in his early teens. How about the disciples? Do you realize that they were very young at the time that the Lord had called them to follow him? Some in their teens, at the very oldest, they may have been in their early 20s. Well, verse 3, for in the eighth year of his reign, so now he's 16, I uh, just got his driver's license at 16. <laughs> well, he, I'm just trying to put it into perspective, not trying to be silly or corny. While he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father, David. And in the 12th year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden image, images, the carved images, and the molded images. They broke down, verse 4, the altars of the Baals in his presence and the incense altars which were above them. He cut down and the wooden images, the carved images and the molded images, he broke in pieces. You almost kind of get the impression that he took great joy in just crushing these things and made dust of them. He pulverized them and then scattered it on the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. Does that sound like a fulfillment of the prophecy? He also, verse 5, burned the bones of the priests on their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so he did, verse 6, in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, as far as Naphtali, and all around with axes. When he had broken down the altars and the wooden images, had beaten the carved images into powder, and cut down all the incense altars throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. In other words, he stayed there until the job was finished. I don't think that his youth at the time that he did this can be overstated, and I say that because it's clear that God gave him these leadership and administrative gifts. As we're going to see here shortly, he uh, delegates a lot of the tasks to the people, and they do it, and they perform the work faithfully. To me, this speaks to how God's callings are God's enablings. In other words, when God calls you, to something, he will package with the calling the enabling to do that which he's called you to. If you think about it, uh, it would be cruel to call you to something and then not also enable you to do that which he's called you to do. He packages the giftings and the enablings with the calling that he has in your life. And such was the case with Josiah. So much so that, again, a little detail in the narrative, but very important. He sees it through. He finishes the project. And it's like he doesn't have permission to return home to Jerusalem until he sees that it has all been complete according to not only his approval, 
but more, moreover and more importantly, according to the prophecy concerning him, that this is exactly and very specifically what he would do. The burning and the removing and the crushing and the breaking of all of these idolatrous uh, symbols and articles. And not only does he remove the sinful things, he also removes the sinful people. I like how one commentator uh, said it. He says, Josiah's reforms did not only remove sinful things, but also the sinful people that promoted and permitted these sinful things. You know, it's easier to remove a thing than it is to remove a person. <laughs> Goes on to say, the idols that filled the temple did not get there or stay there on their own. There were idolatrous priests who were responsible for these sinful practices. Any thorough reformation can not only deal with sinful things, it must also deal with sinful people. If sinful people are not dealt with, they will quickly bring back the sinful things that were righteously removed. Uh, you'll forgive the metaphor and the analogy and comparison, but I liken it to cancer. You have to remove all of the cancer lest it continue to spread and ultimately lead to death. Verse 8, in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the temple, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, Maaseiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Joahaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. When they came to Hilkiah, the high priest, they delivered the money that was brought into the house of God, which the Levites, who kept the doors, had gathered from the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim, from all the remnant of Israel, from all Judah and Benjamin, and which they had brought back to Jerusalem. Then, verse 10, they put it in the hand of the foreman, who had the oversight of the house of the Lord, and they gave it to the workmen who worked in the house of the Lord to repair and restore the house. Is this like a deja vu all over again? You have an evil king that reinstitutes these idolatrous practices and idols, and then you have a good king that goes in and removes everything and rebuilds and restores and re remodels, as it were. Verse 11, they gave it to the craftsmen and builders to buy hewn stone and timber for beams and to the floor to floor the houses which the kings of Judah had destroyed. Kind of reminds me and sounds like what uh, we had to deal with when we first bought this building. It's like everything was just destroyed. And I love verse 12, and the men did the work faithfully. Their overseers were Jehath and Obadiah, the Levites of the sons of Merari, and Zechariah, and Mushila, uh, Meshulam of the sons of the Kohathites to supervise. And by the way, the Kohathites were the musicians. Uh, they are from uh, uh, actually, they're related to Moses. Others of the Levites, all of whom were skillful with instruments of music, were over the burden bearers and were overseers of all who did work in any kind of service. And some of the Levites were scribes, officers, and gatekeepers. So here we see the delegation. And keep in mind, you know how old he is? I mean, he's, he's over the hill, man. 26. He's 26 years old when he does this, when he begins this process of restoring the temple, just as, by the way, Hezekiah did before him. And what's interesting to me is he's able to organize all of this and delegate the work, and he does so to men who were told did it faithfully. Also very interesting he actually has the Levites, the priestly tribe, and the musicians oversee the work of the renovation. That'd be like having the worship team oversee the, 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 the work, the uh, construction, and the renovation. So uh, verse 14, now when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, 
Hilkiah, the priest, found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Then Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan, the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. <laughs> and Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. What? <laughs> this is the temple, right? The house of the Lord. And they're just now, after all of these years, finding the book of the law. Well, that's interesting. And for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that up to this point, the word of God was gone. It was lost, which means it was never opened, which means it was never read, which might actually explain a lot as to why it was that the temple was given over, fully given over, to this idolatrous worship. Last week, we kind of likened it to, as graphic as it might be, again, to kind of put it into perspective, so it's not just reading words on the pages of our Bible, but it would be like bringing pornographic images and into this beautiful building and putting it up on this screen. That's what they had done. The word of God was non-existent. It was probably collecting dust somewhere in some back room there in the temple, and they had just found it. It was still in the temple, but they had just found it. And they were worshiping these, these images, and the worship was very, again, you'll forgive the graphic nature of this, but it, it's important to understand the why behind the what of what Josiah does. This was so abominable in the sight of God. And this is why it had to be removed. And this is why the people that promoted it, that were a part of it, that allowed it, that did it, that brought it into the temple also had to be removed in such a dramatic fashion. That's how grievous it would have been. Well, what's really sad is this has profound application to the condition of the church today in these last days. And by that I mean uh, the word of God has been lost. The word of God is rare in the land as we read in the Old Testament. Well, in the church today, the word of God is rare in the church today. It's so sad because... Many a church, and I don't want to be derogatory and beat up on or even name, you know, any particular church or churches, but what's really sad is you can go to a church today, even on this island, in this beautiful state we call home here in Hawaii, and you can barely, rarely hear the Word of God. And if you do, it's a sort of a, an, a, a, an ambiguous, uh, sort of obscure reference to a verse. And they'll quote from the Bible. They might talk about the Bible, but there's no teaching the Bible. My wife, before she got saved, was uh, listening to this um, kind of new age Thing where the woman pastor would uh, quote scripture and then go off on this whole aberrant thing and then she got saved and she looked back on that and it was so subtle I mean they have a Bible it's almost like it legitimizes the uh, you know the person who's opening it or referring to it or quoting from it they're not preaching the word. They're not teaching the Bible. This is why, again, I am a Calvary Chapel and have been and will always be because the emphasis is on the word of God, simply teaching the word of God simply. 
expositionally, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And I know I've shared this in the past, and perhaps this is as good of a time as any to share it again. But I actually really, i got to be careful when I say it. i got to qualify it because I actually really enjoy teaching the Old Testament more than the New. <gasps> You do? Yeah. You ready for this? I'm really going to jam your gears on this one. I actually enjoy the Old Testament as much as I enjoy Bible prophecy. <gasps> okay, that's, that's too much. What, what, are you, what are you saying? Well, here's what I'm saying. When you understand the Old Testament, it brings the New Testament to life. It's been said that the Old Testament conceals what the New Testament reveals. I know I've shared this as well. When I was a new believer, I was a blank slate. I, I didn't know anything, and I didn't actually step in a church until I had read the Bible all the way through from Genesis to Revelation for the first time. It took me about six months, and it was one of those uh, living Bibles that was basically... Uh, a stretch for me <laughs> because the vocabulary was very limited and I had really done a lot of brain damage and anyway I'm not proud of that but uh, I just got a hold of this good news Bible and I read it all the way through and I couldn't put it down and I started in the Old Testament and when I got into Leviticus and they had all the you know the, the rituals and the sacrifices and the animal sacrifices it really messed me up because I'm like, you mean I've got to get a lamb, a, a, an animal, and I've got to sacrifice it for my sins? Are you kidding me? I, do they do that? Because, I, you know, again, I'm a blank slate. I hadn't got to the New Testament yet. <laughs> and by the way, when I did, it was like, of course, Jesus is the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth once and for all. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't have to slay a lamb. He's the lamb that was slain. I mean, it was just, you know, an epiphany and my eyes were open and my mind was blown. But I, I remember driving by churches and I'm looking for livestock because I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, this is what the Bible says. That's how, you know, <laughs> anyway. Um, what was I actually talking about here? It's, it was something very profound, I'm sure. Oh, the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament. And by the way, when you understand the Old Testament, you also have a greater understanding and appreciation of the New Testament. On Sunday, we referred to the typology in the Old Testament concerning the pre-tribulation rapture. And it's replete throughout, even starting in Genesis with Joseph, who took a Gentile bride before, before the seven-year famine, at which time she is not heard from again. That's a type, a picture in Scripture of the pre-tribulation rapture. You can go throughout. You get to the book of Daniel. We talked about this on Sunday. Again, Old Testament. You know what's really sad is when you talk to believers, well-intentioned, but to them, the Old Testament is just that, old. <laughs> it's, the, it's the old. I had a, a sister share with me out of the uh, Hebrew Bible that they don't even call it the new uh, covenant. They call it the renewed covenant. Kind of changes the complexion of it uh, a little bit because by saying new, you're sort of dismissive of the old. When you say renewed, it's a fulfillment of the old. And that's exactly what the New Testament is. Even the communion table, as we talked about on Sunday and shared in communion, as we always do on the first Sunday of each month. And we talked about how that Jesus is the Passover lamb. And he says, I eagerly await to partake with you when this finds its fulfillment in my kingdom. What fulfillment? Well, what the disciples didn't quite understand at the time, which is why Jesus was explaining it to them, was that they were celebrating the Passover with the Passover lamb. How's that one? The Passover lamb is there fulfilling the Passover prophecy. 
And the very first of the seven feasts is the Feast of Passover. And you're not going to know that unless you know Leviticus chapter 23, where you have the feasts of the Lord. They're all prophetic types. Everything pointed to the person of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. So you have a greater appreciation for the New Testament. I didn't mean to go on and on about this, but, <laughs> but see, this is what, well, let me just say it like this. Christians today are being robbed. They're being robbed of the richness of the Old Testament. It is so rich. It is so powerful. And it's just, it, I'll liken it to this. It's like watching, when you know the Old Testament, it's like reading the New Testament in IMAX 3D. <laughs> because you now have the Old Testament foundation so everything starts clicking together you start connecting these you know scriptural dots between the old testament and the new testament that fills in all the blanks and what's so sad is that the word of god is lost in the church of god today if you were to ask me what i thought was the sign of the Lord's return in addition to Israel as God's prophetic clock, this would have to be it. And this is really 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, where Paul writing to Timothy says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, in, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. You have to understand, Timothy's a young pastor. He says, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. And here it is. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, here's what they're going to do. To suit their own desires... They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Pastor Chuck Smith used to always say, when you reject the truth, you'll believe any lie. When you reject the truth, you create this vacuum and you're susceptible to, vulnerable to any kind of a lie because you've rejected the truth. I think of the detail in the spiritual armor in Ephesians 6 where Paul talks about the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, and then the belt of truth. And what's so interesting, and the church in Ephesus would have absolutely understood this, it was the belt that held everything together. Even the helmet, when it wasn't worn, would attach to the belt. The breastplate and the shoes went all the way up to protect the legs. They would all connect to the belt. The sword, of course, would be connected to the belt. The shield of faith would also be connected to the belt. How appropriate. The one thing that holds everything together is the truth. You take the truth out of the equation, Everything is falling apart because you don't have the truth. Nothing to hang on. Nothing to hold on to. Nothing to be secured in. I really believe that the evil in the world today is directly proportionate to the diminishing and even the eliminating of God's word. You know, I was born in 1962. <laughs> and uh, don't do the math. Um, so this year I'll be uh, 55. I remember when I was uh, Josiah's age at 26, 55 was really old. And now I am that. So anyway. Um, but uh, in 1962 they took prayer out of schools. And ever since then, when God was kicked out of the public sector, you could, 
see the diminishing and the deteriorating of society proportionate to the removing of God's word. And such is the case with what happened here in the temple when they found the word. And, and here's the reason why, by the way. The word of God is a mirror. The law of God is a mirror. It shows us us in our true sinful condition. We see ourselves in the mirror of God's word as sinners falling short of the perfect standard of God's righteousness. Now, what happens, let's just take that analogy and let's uh, superimpose it just on a practical level. What would happen uh, if you removed every mirror in your house and your car and you had no mirrors with which to look at yourself and make the necessary adjustments <laughs> when you look at yourself in that mirror. Oh, that's got to go. That needs to be combed. That needs to be shaved. That needs a miracle. <laughs> that needs something. This needs that. Why? Because I'm looking at the image in the perfect mirror, which shows me my true condition. And this is what James says in chapter 1. Verses 22 through 25. He says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do it, do what it says, is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. In other words, don't be merely hearers of God's word. In the mirror of God's word, be a doer. Do something about what you see in that mirror. Just like you do in the morning, when you look at your mug in the mirror in the morning, uh, and if you're anything like me, your first response is, Lord, come quickly, Lord Jesus, please. Verse 16, so Shaphan carried the book to the king, bringing the king word, saying, all that was committed to your servants they are doing, and they have gathered the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hand of the overseers and the workmen. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Verse 19, interesting. Thus it happened when the king heard the words of the law that he tore his clothes. You have to understand that in that culture at that time, that tearing of the clothes was an expression of grief, of sorrow, of conviction, of sin. And this is his response. And this is a textbook response as it relates to one realizing their true condition when they see themselves in the mirror of God's word. And this is how revivals start. Revivals start when the word of God convicts the people of God by the spirit of God. Pastor Chuck shares about how, um, oh, I, I knew I was going to do this. I, I can't remember his name. It'll come to me probably like 10 o'clock after we're all back home, but... Uh, he, he studied revivals, and he studied the uh, Jesus people revival when all of these hippies were coming to Christ back in the 60s and the 70s. I'm still trying to think of the name, but <laughs> by the way, uh, don't be bashful. If you know who I'm talking about, please shout it out. No, 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 no. Uh -uh. I, I, know he, I know who he is, but anyway... Ah, it's going to really bug me. Don't you hate that when the name is right on your tongue and you can't? Anyway, he, he said to Pastor Chuck, he said, what I notice about the Calvary chapels is that it's the word of God being ministered to the people of God 
by the power of the Spirit of God. And that's what the revival is. And those are the components, if you will, of revival. Charles Spurgeon said this, if we want revivals, we must revive our reverence for the Word of God. Ah, that's it. We live in a day and an age where there's no reverence. There's a lost reverence for the holiness of the holy word of God. You know how powerful the word of God is? If you ever want to refresh your memory as to what the word of God is in the life of a believer, read Psalm 119. It's a little bit long, but (laughs) read Psalm 119. The word of God, it's all about the word of God, the word of God, the word of God. Verse 20, then the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, Abdon, the son of Micah, Shaphan, the scribe, and Asaiah, a servant of the king, saying, go inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. Stop right there. Do you realize, now keep in mind, Josiah is eight years old when he becomes king. He's not heard, read, seen, touched, smelled the written word of God. He's heard it orally, passed on. He's heard about it, but he has never heard the word of God written, which might explain in in large measure his response when he hears it by tearing his clothes. So concerning the words of the book that is found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us because our fathers, listen, have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. So Hilkiah, verse 22, and those the king had appointed went to Hulda, the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tokhath, the son of Hasrah, keeper of the wardrobe. (laughs) She dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they spoke to her to that effect. What? She's a seamstress. She's a seamstress. How interesting is this, that Josiah would command them to go and inquire of the Lord And they do so by going to this woman. And yes, she's a prophetess, but here's the question. Why wouldn't they go instead to other prophets like Jeremiah and Zephaniah? They could have easily gone to these prophets, these men of God, these prophets of God, but they don't. They go to this woman who's basically a seamstress. So why? Well, you know, because oftentimes God will choose to use the least and the last. God chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, the weak to shame the strong. And this is the case here. I think God loves to use the people we would never think God could ever use. In that way, only he gets the glory. Adam Clark said it best this way. We find from this, and we have many facts in all ages to corroborate it, that bishop or a priest may in some cases not possess the true knowledge of God, and that a simple woman possessing the life of God in her soul may have more knowledge of the divine testimonies than many of those whose office it is to explain and enforce them. In other words, it's that precious saint, that sister in Christ, sitting ever so obscurely in the back that God may choose to use instead of this loudmouth pastor up here behind this pulpit. You know, oftentimes, and I'll even say most of the time, they're on a 
given day in this beautiful church building will be more ministry taking place between you than there is from pulpit to pew. God will have a word for you and it will come by way of somebody that God has put it on their heart to share with you. And it happens in the foyer, it happens in the kitchen, it can happen in here, it can happen upstairs, it can happen outside in the parking lot. That's where ministry takes place. And it's oftentimes the person that you would never think that God would choose to use. There's an example of this really throughout scripture, but um, in the earthly genealogy recorded in the gospel of Matthew of the Savior himself, do you know who's in there? We did a study of this when, this is many years ago now, when we went through the book of Matthew, but this would have been unthinkable in that culture because women were deemed to be of such little value. And then when you get into Matthew's genealogy of Jesus the Christ, you'll find in there two women who had very sinful pasts. In fact, so sinful that it even involved prostitution. In the genealogy, the lineage of the Savior of the world, the first one is named Tamar. And oh, by the way, you have to be in the Old Testament to know this. Uh, she fathered twin boys, Perez and Zira, by Judah, her father-in-law. And the way she did it, first of all, Judah would not give her uh, his third son because she was married to his first son, and then he died. And as was the custom in that day, and it's actually a practice still to this day in the Middle East. So the first uh, son dies. So then the second son is required to marry the widow to give her children to carry on the family name. So the second born son of Judah marries her, and he dies. So dad's like, you know what? <laughs> Let's see, I, my, you, my first son that you married died. My second son that you married died. I've got a third son here. I don't want him to die. So I'm not going to let him marry you to give you children to carry on the family name. Well, she wants to carry on the family name and have children. So what does she do? She disguises herself as a prostitute and seduces him and conceives by him these uh, twin boys, and they're in the lineage, the genealogy of the Savior of the world. How's that one? How's that one? The second one is Rahab, perhaps more well-known. She was a prostitute living in Jericho, and she hid the spies from the king in order to save them and she herself is saved when she makes a profession of faith in the true God of Israel. And get the, again, Old Testament, Old Testament, right? Well, check this out. The dots are connected because she's even mentioned in the Hebrews Hall of Faith, as it's called in chapter 11, verse 31. By faith, and here's the detail, we're told what she does for a living. The prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. She, check out the list in Hebrews. You got men like Noah, Noah, and then Rahab. <laughs> you got David. And Rahab, <laughs> you got these great men of faith, these by faith, Abraham, by faith, Rahab, the prostitute, by faith. And she's in the same list, recorded, mentioned all of these generations later. And here we are in the year 2017 talking about this woman <laughs> with a very shady past whom God used and by faith was saved. Verse 23, then she answered them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me, thus says the Lord, behold, 
I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants. All the curses that are written in the book which they have read before the king of Judah. And here's why, verse 25, because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be poured out on this place and get this and not be quenched. Wow. It's unquenchable. It's unquenchable. It's insatiable. His wrath is insatiable and unquenchable. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how they must have felt when they hear this pronouncement of God's judgment upon Israel? It's almost like, I wish I'd have never read this thing. I, w I wish I would have never read. I wish I would have never sent the these men to you to hear of this judgment of your wrath your unquenchable wrath, to think that God's wrath was so aroused that it would be literally impossible for it to be quenched. However, as we're about to see in the next verse, Josiah is going to seek the Lord and he's going to humble himself before the Lord and because of it, he's going to be spared of this judgment. Verse 26, but as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, in this manner you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which you have heard, the written word from the law of God, because, listen to this, because your heart was tender, and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and against its inhabitants. And you humbled yourself before me. And you tore your clothes. And you wept before me. I also have heard you, says the Lord. Surely I will gather you to your fathers and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace and your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place and its inhabitants. So they brought back word to the king. Before we get into some details that we have recorded here concerning Josiah's response, I want to mention something that is not so easily seen at first read and it has to do with the words that we heard before concerning Hezekiah because you prayed I have heard I think it's Psalm 6 great Psalm especially if you're going through a difficult time because David starts off in the first seven verses, he's just pouring his heart out to the Lord. He's just crying out to the Lord, Lord, how long I drench my pillow at night with my tears. I'm, I'm weary in my bones. And how long, Lord? It, we don't know specifically what it was that David was going through at the time. Some suggest it was when his son Absalom had rebelled against him and sought to kill him. And he just cries out to the Lord. And then about verse 8, he says this, very interesting. He, he actually speaks to the fear, to the trial, to the difficulty, to the pain. And he says, depart from me, for the Lord has heard my prayer. You're in trouble now. I cried out, Unto the Lord, he has hearkened unto the voice of my cry. Depart from me, fear. Depart from me, discouragement. Depart from me, doubt. Depart from me, trial. God has heard my prayer. And then he doesn't leave it there. He goes on to say, and God is going to answer my prayer. Get out of here. Get out of here. In other words, like with Hezekiah, like here with Josiah, because you prayed, I have heard. That sense chills up and down my spine because the implication is that if I don't pray, that means he doesn't hear. Is that not what James says? You have not because you ask not. 
I think it was Jim Cimbala in that 1994 teaching at a conference titled My House Shall Be a House of Prayer where he shares very openly and candidly about his daughter who had gotten away from the Lord. And he describes very um, pic picturesque this scene in heaven with a loving heavenly father who has everything we need for that situation we're in. And he's waiting on standby, just, just waiting for us to ask him. I will give you whatever you need. Just ask me. Just pray. And it's not like God is saying, I'm going to get you to pray one way or the other. That's not God. God is saying, I love you. I will give you whatever you need. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above and there's no changing of his mind. There's no shifting. There's no variation of shadow. In other words, God doesn't, isn't wishy-washy. I'm going to give it to you. No, I'm not going to give it to you. No. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above. He, he wants to give it, but he doesn't give it. Why? Because we don't ask. Because you prayed... I have heard. And I love David saying, speaking to that fear that had so gripped him and paralyzed him, he, he says to it, hey, I'm putting you on notice, man. <laughs> Depart from me because the Lord has heard my prayer. You're in deep kimchi now. <laughs> You're in deep trouble now because God has not only heard my prayer, he has answered my... You know the prayer that God cannot answer is the prayer that we have not prayed? Think about that. Let me say the same thing a different way. If I don't pray for it, then there's a pretty good chance that God is not going to answer a prayer that I did not pray for or ask for. Well, that's not fair. Doesn't it seem like that God should not make it like that? I mean, he wants us to come crawling on our hands and knees begging him? No, not at all. But how would you know how great your God is to provide all that you need unless it's a need? And how are you ever going to grow in your faith in this great God that you have if you don't come to him with that need that you have and ask him to provide it? Let him be God. Let him show himself Faithful. Well, I wanted to uh, mention uh, specific reasons that God responded by hearing his prayer and hearkening unto the voice of his cry. First, um, notice Josiah's response it's in verse 26, where his first response was to seek the Lord. It's, here's the problem and let's be honest sometimes prayer is a last resort it reminds me of the story that's told where the wife comes to the husband and says honey we need to pray to which the husband says is it that bad I mean when did prayer become the last resort it should always be the first response it should almost be a default and I think as we grow in grace and mature in Christ, we become, you know when Paul says pray continually, it's, it's a constant attitude of prayer where you're, you're talking to the Lord throughout. You're having a, a conversation, getting back to David in the Psalms. I mean, he, you read what he says and you would think he was talking to his best friend. Well, think about it, he was. He was. I mean, he's, he's not formal, oh, omnipotent God, creator of the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. No, he's like, oh, Lord, Lord, how long, how long? He's talking, he's crying out. You know what? Well, anyway, I, I, 
I could go on all night on that, but his, his first response is to seek the Lord. I think the Lord takes notice of that. Isn't this what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. Psalm 63, uh, 1, another great psalm. They're all great psalms. Oh, God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. In other words, the first thing I'm going to do when I wake up in the morning is seek you. That's the first thing I'm going to do in the morning. Hebrews eleven six. 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And, listen, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I think God finds it irresistible when we diligently seek him. So much so that he rewards that diligent seeking of him. The second reason is Josiah's response in verse 27, which is his tender heart towards the Lord. Now, again, this is one of those things at first read, you maybe don't pay a lot of attention to it, but, but this man, this young man, had a real tender heart towards the Lord, the things of the Lord. And I think that it is of paramount importance to have a heart that is soft, towards the Lord, supple, supple for the seed of God's word to germinate. We have that parable of the sower that Jesus taught concerning the four different types of soils. When the seed hits the soil, it's only the supple soil that that seed is able to implant in and germinate and sprout and bear fruit. But if that soil is hard, there's, there's no fruit. It will just simply die. He had a soft and tender, and I'll add this word, a sensitive heart. He had a sensitivity to that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. He had a sensitivity to the Word of God. He wasn't desensitized to the Word of God. The third reason is his response, which is also in verse 27, which is that he humbled himself. He humbled himself before the Lord, and he did so because of the word of the Lord. And interesting, upon hearing God's word, it was his immediate response. His immediate response was to humble himself in the sight of the Lord. Time doesn't permit. We talk about it often, but the scriptures are replete with passages about how God shows grace and mercy to the humble, but that he conversely resists the proud. There's a proverb, too, that says this, that with humility comes wisdom. You need wisdom, the wisdom from above that James talks about, that's first pure and peaceable and gentle and easy to be entreated and full of mercy and good fruits without hypocrisy or partiality. Interesting, bearing fruit unto righteousness. You want that wisdom? James says any who, who asks, God's going to give it. He's going to give it liberally. He's not even going to withhold any. He's going to give you all the wisdom that, that you ask for. But here's a, here's a prerequisite. Humility. So if the Proverbs say that with humility comes wisdom, does that mean with pride comes folly? Absolutely. Absolutely. Listen, if you're in a situation where you're really praying about a, an important decision in your life and you need the wisdom from God, if you're harboring an attitude of pride without exception, you will make the wrong decision. And on the other side of that, if your heart is humble towards the Lord and tender towards the Lord and even sensitive towards the Lord, then he will give you that wisdom. It's a teachable humility, as it's been called. The fourth reason is his response also in the same verse where 
he tore his clothes, weeping before the Lord. This is conviction. This is that godly sorrow that leads to a genuine repentance. It's not the sorrow of being caught. This is the godly sorrow that leads to a true and genuine repentance. Well, let's uh, bring it into a, a close. We'll finish the chapter. Verse 29. Then the king sent and gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. The king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the Levites and all the people, great and small. And he, interesting, read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the house of the Lord. Then, verse 31, the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all of his heart and all of his soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in this book. He's 26 years old. And verse 32, he made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin take a stand. So the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. Thus, Josiah removed all the abominations from all the country that belonged to the children of Israel and made all who were present in Israel diligently serve the Lord their God. All his days they did not depart from following the Lord God of their fathers. So the chapter ends with what I see as the impact that the word of God can have, not just on an individual, but on God's people as a whole. And it was all due to the tender heart, the teachable heart that Josiah had. And what's really interesting is that it was Josiah himself who read the words of the Book of the Covenant. You know, he could have easily had somebody else read it. Why, why do you think it is? Another very interesting detail. Why do you think it is that he, the king, chose to read the Word of God? I believe it's because of his love. He loved the Word. He loved the Word, and he loved to read the Word. And he wanted to read the word in the hearing of all of the people. And it packed more weight, I think, too, to have the king read the word. <laughs> so that all the people were told, small and great, heard it, and they took heed to it. And they did so of their own volition. They chose to follow his lead, and they committed themselves to do it. And we're told they did so all the days of Josiah's life. And I want to end there. <laughs> Nothing makes me happier than to end a chapter in a Bible study this way because that's not always the case, as you know. Sometimes you end with some pretty graphic and gnarly stuff. So we're going to end it there tonight. Why don't you stand and we'll pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this chapter. Lord, thank you for what's in it. Thank you, too, for what's not in it. Lord, thank you for all of the personal application that we can take with us from our time together in your word tonight. Lord, thank you for Josiah's example. Thank you for the truths that are here. Thank you for the word, the word of God that is here, and the reverence for the tenderness, tenderness of heart towards your word. Lord, we want to be numbered amongst those of whom it can be said they have a tender heart towards the Lord and towards the word. Lord, thank you in Jesus' name.